We just did a very, very quick round, round table on uh, arth definition of arthritis, uh, what causes arthritis, and a diagnosis of arthritis. Let's talk about treatment options right now. What do we have? What Right now in the market, what do we have to so-called treat arthritis? Okay, So it's broadly divided into two different groups. Either you're managing or you're actually treating it. Okay, so most of the cases manage, you'll go through some treatment options and I'll explain to you the difference. So we have our usual medication, okay? So uh, plenty of drugs out there, even for humans, same thing, okay? So many of the vets, they will uh, say that, okay, yeah, we can do X, Y, Z, but they tend to go back to the drugs to say that, yeah, we can give these drugs to give a uh, sort of a pain relief. Um, surgery, okay, we'll go to that in a bit. Complementary therapies, which uh, I'm sure a lot of people are interested in in this room. Um, Nova techniques, so just giving uh, giving you a little uh, idea of what is available out there in terms of sort of a cutting edge medicine. If there's such a thing for vet medicine, consider uh, considering we're always 15 to 20 years behind human medicine anyway. And uh, lifestyle, what can we change? When I say we, I'm talking about pet owners. Okay, that we can change to help the animal. Okay, so let's uh, have a sort of brief talk about medication. So. The cornerstone of arthritic management, I use the word management, not treatment, management, is using what we call non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs for short, okay? So this is the most common, most widespread medication that pretty much we as vets are taught and is what is used the most, okay? So it's the cornerstone of medical management. Just, uh, just to give you an example, it's the same class as ibuprofen. Okay, the reason why I bring this up is for two different reasons. It's a whole, it's a, it's to sort of hone in two different reasons. One is that just to give us a gauge, because you may not have heard of the dogs and saints, but certainly you have heard of ibuprofen, which we take. Okay, so that's a reason just to give you guys a sort of gauge of understanding what class of drug it is. The second thing is a reminder: ibuprofen is extremely toxic in dogs. So please do not give ibuprofen at home. Okay, very, very toxic in dogs. The, the, the liver just can't cope with it. Okay, so it's not as though, because a lot of owners say, that, oh yeah, my vet mentioned non steroidals Oh yeah, I'm taking ibuprofen. I look at the label, it's non steroidals Surely it's okay to give my dog. Please don't. Please don't. If you don't take anything from this presentation, please do not give ibuprofen in dogs. <laughs> yeah, have you that? Okay, so don't. Okay, um, and uh, so it's used as a pain relief. Okay, it's got anti-inflammatory action. So as the name suggests, it's a non-steroidal, not steroid, anti-inflammatory drug, okay? So there's this thing called COX-1 and COX-2, okay? Um, those are little receptors that we have in our body, okay? And the idea behind it is, and this is extremely woolly, the more we find out, the more we realize that we do not know what we're talking about, okay? But just to give you a rough idea. So COX-1 and COX-2, uh, those are originally thought to be the pain receptors that causes pain. So if you actually inhibit those two coxes, you are stopping from feeling pain, okay? The reason why it is not so, um, uh, not so straightforward is because cox1 and cox2 are also needed for normal functions. So they are not all bad. So you cannot really inhibit all of it because you will get other problems if you do that. So hence, um, that there are, you, you hear some, some vets, they mention a COX-2 inhibitor. So the, 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 next sort of, uh, the next chain of thought was that uh, COX-2 is the one that is more uh, important for pain relief. COX-1 is a good COX, okay? Uh, and hence, a whole new breed of non steroid anti-inflammatories came out to be more COX-2 preferential compared to COX-1. Okay, I can see people getting bored already. I won't dwell too long in this. Okay, so but fundamentally, that's what they talk about. Then afterwards, they realize that actually we need COX-2 as well. So long story short, every time they do something, they think it's all for the best intention. They find out more, they realize that, okay, that's not the best drug. So there isn't really a perfect drug, really. Okay, so, uh, and these medications have been around for decades. The most common ones, very, very, a lot of different types, different brands, different active ingredients. The most common ones that people will know is caprofen, things like a Rimadil. Uh, which we've heard of. Uh, meloxicam has been around for quite some time as well. So caprofen is the one that's been around for a good sort of 20-25 years really. And uh, meloxicam has been certainly around for the last sort of 15-20 years as well. And caprofen is usually the drug of choice where they compare it to if they're going to develop a new non-steroidal. What I mean is that when they find a new non-steroidal and they'll test 
to two groups of animals. One is a caprofen and one is on a new non steroidal and that is the benchmark that they always use to say that it is no worse than using caprofen using these. But because of the new one, I have all this extra advantage. So caprofen is almost like the baseline standard. Okay. Then after that came meloxicam, which uh, which really really hit the market quite well because of its uh, liquid form. People just found it easier to give a liquid than to give a tablet. Okay, and into the food and things like that. And also another advantage of uh, or perceived advantage of meloxicam is that it's much easier to titrate it. It's much easier to give less of it. So example, you can give 20 kilo dose, and some, uh, sometimes you can reduce it to 18 kilo, 17 kilo, 16 kilo. Rest for a tablet, you know, you can only break it to half, quarter, you can't really do too much of titration with that. So that is uh, the sole prevalence of meloxicam. Then newer ones, like uh, Privicox, which is uh, this other, uh, so these are all the coccyps, as you can see, they all end with Phyrocoxib, Mevacoxib, Semicoxib. So all this is what we call the sort of uh, um, um, COX-2 inhibitors, whereby they are preferentially inhibiting COX-2 much, much more than COX-1 compared to meloxicam and caprofen. So these are all the newer ones, so supposedly the better ones, the one with less side effects because it leaves, it spares the COX-1. Does it make sense? Okay, but like I said, the more they find out, the more that they find out is actually not true. <laughs> so uh, it's just uh, in the end, the way I look at it is very simple. It's like any other drugs. Some work for better, some work for not. When we get a headache, some people use paracetamol, works for them. Some people use ibuprofen, some people use aspirin. And it doesn't, if ibuprofen doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean that ibuprofen is a bad drug or less effective drug. It's just for you individually, it doesn't work. Do you see what I mean? Okay, so that's why sometimes it's a trial and error. And that is a tricky thing because the reality is that uh, if you try, say, meloxicam you, uh, and you can't really manage it, then it doesn't mean that non steroidals is not good for this dog or doesn't work for this dog. It well could mean that we just have not found the right one yet. So sometimes you may get your vets saying, let's try a different one. Or let's try a different one. So there really is no end to trying, really, to be really honest. And, uh, and uh, what we're always looking for is response to treatment. Because it's one thing us saying that that's not good, but another thing we actually want to see some response. And sometimes the reality is that it does need a few different tries because it's just like how uh, if you try aspirin, it doesn't get a headache, you don't really go, oh, drugs doesn't work on me. <laughs> you know, you just try something else until it sort of works. So that is why some vets try. It's not because they're just randomly trying. Why didn't you give me this one from the start? Because we simply do not know. Yeah, because some, some animals, they actually work very well on meloxicam, they don't do well on the rest. And some is the other way around. So oral mod uh, uh, other sort of oral medications. What other things apart from non steroidal anti-inflammatories is that are on the market right now? So we have got tramadol. Okay, so tramadol is something that a lot of people uh, know because it has huge surge of popularity about sort of eight, nine years ago. And that's when I sort of uh, qualified for a few years, then suddenly everybody talks about tramadol. Then it was like the next drug of choice to use either on its own or usually in concurrent with a non steroidal anti-inflammatory. So for example, a dog has been on metacam or something like that, amloxicam, and it's no better or it's, it's okay, but it's still in pain. So they say, okay, let's add something else rather than instead of tramadol. It's a very, very uh, popular drug at a point of time uh, for a few different reasons. One is that everybody knows about it because it is a human drug. So it's not too much of a skeptical use for it. And secondly, it was very, very cheap uh, because it is a human drug. So, and, uh, so that certainly was one way that they put it on. Lately, I have to say that even personally and from many sort of uh, experts, they have slowly moved away from tramadol because the evidence just simply isn't there. There isn't really a huge amount of evidence to say that the animal actually benefits from tramadol when you really, really drive down to look for it. And sometimes it's just the owner thinks it's better because they're giving it, the owners feel happier. And hence, they tell us it's better, is that okay? But the reality is that when I actually went down to do further studies, tramadol wasn't re isn't really as um, amazing as it's, it's made out to be. And certainly it has its own side effects because it is a what we call atypical or weird opiate. Same class as morphine. So for some dogs, they do trip. I've heard reports of dogs howling, not really knowing where it is, sleeping more than usual, so and sometimes even guess, getting a gastrointestinal upsets and things like that. So it itself is not a benign medication as well, but like I said, it gained popularity uh, uh, quite some years back, and uh, there is certainly plenty out there for, for, for this particular medication. 
Pardil V. Okay, so this is quite interesting medication as well. So this is actually a licensed um, drug, which means that uh, when I use the word licensed drug, means that it is actually uh, licensed for animals or that particular species for that particular condition. Okay, compared to tramadol, it's used off license. Okay, so Pardil V contains of two different drugs inside there, two active ingredients. One is uh, paracetamol, and one is codeine. Okay, so we know what paracetamol is. Panadol, so to speak, okay, and codeine is a um, another opioid, so same class as morphine, although not as powerful, okay. So with those two combined, they came out with this particular drug called Pardial V, same again, okay, the evidence behind it is tricky, okay, because, um, so certainly animals uh, that is on meloxicam didn't do very well, they go to Pardial V, some of them do quite well, some of them don't, I, I can't really get a consistent result with that as well, so, and they've push down the studies more and more and they find that actually if it gets better the paracetamol side of things is actually not doing too much to the animal it's the codeine side of things that's helping so yeah so go, go figure so that's also another one that's quite uh, um, commonly used on the market right now then the next two drugs it's uh, fairly interesting is gabapentin and amantidin okay so these two drugs work in a very different way it's not really an anti-inflammatory it's not really a opioid what it does is that it regulates or deregulates the pain receptors up and down your spine okay so yes i'm feeling the pain in my foot but i'm just simply down regulating that sensor that message up to the brain so if my brain don't register pain i wouldn't show pain does it make sense? Okay, so if you think about it, how we register pain, if you touch something hot, it is because there's nerves carrying your, from, your, uh, from, from your finger all the way down to your spine and going up to your brain. If there is any interruption in that system, you won't feel anything, isn't it? So that is how these two medications work. So they act on your spine centrally rather than locally in the joint itself compared to non steroidals So same again, this is sort of used in, usually in concurrent uh, with um, sort of a non steroidals uh, or just on its own really because uh, that's how they can do to manage more of a sort of a spinal pain rather than arthritis itself. Yeah? Um, oh, CBD oil, controversial. So, <laughs> let's just chuck it out there. <laughs> so CBD oil, which you may or may not have heard of, has sort of gained popularity in the last two, three years, four years or so in the vet world, but it certainly has been used quite um, off the vet world for quite some time now. And uh, usually it is more of, a, it's, it's um, humans have started talking about it, okay? And now it's slowly pushing onto the vet medicine side of it. And it's only in the last few months that the uh, VMD, the vet medicine um, directorate, which is in charge of all our medications, actually made CBD oil a, a, a sort of a regulated vet drug, okay, because they've seen what it sort of does. So this one, um, without delving too much into it, it has got different effects, uh, different usage, and they're looking at um, the different receptors called uh, cannabinoid receptors uh, in our body that can also help with pain. Um, it works well in some dogs, it doesn't work well in other dogs. Uh, in the next few months, I'm actually having another presentation just on CBD oil itself, so I'm not gonna delve too much in, into it apart from saying it exists. And certainly one thing which I'll note, it, uh, I'll say is that there's a lot of different grades to it, okay, so not all CBD oils are as harmless or as effective as they make up to be because there's so much difference in them. Um, and so that's just one thing to note really, yeah? Fine. So another thing of med still medicine, okay, so still talking about drugs, cartrophan injections. Okay, so this is a um, injection that I saw manufactured in Australia. And uh, basically, it's a series of injections. And what Cartrofan is, is that it helps with the joints itself, just to make sure that, um, can I take a look, please? Um, just to make sure that it is, uh, uh, it's helping the joint itself, okay, in terms of pain relief and also, the, I don't think they use the word repair, but it's almost as though uh, supplementing the joint itself, okay? And sometimes what happens is that top-ups are needed from time to time, and usually there is a series of injections. So I, um, if I'm not wrong, the, the sort of sequence is one injection once a week for four weeks, then after you may repeat the whole sequence six months time again. So it's just a series of injection. What is uh, sort of uh, important to know about this is that we do not use it concurrently with steroids, because it's been shown to, in combination, it can cause bleeding issues. 
so to speak. So that's why when they go to this, we don't use non steroid anti inflammatories. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, discuss a little bit about surgery. What sort of surgery is there? Okay, when we go to surgery, we talk about like hip replacements. Okay, so if you take a look over here, the this is a bad hip. You can all see that really now that we understand what we're looking out for. Fluffiness, flat head, very, very shallow socket. You can see the ball is pretty much out of the socket. It's nowhere near in the socket itself. Okay, so that is very, very painful. So what they do is that they take the painful bit away. So they take this painful joint away and they put an artificial joint instead. So what they've done is that literally take the source of pain away, okay? And it is usually done as a last resort. As you can imagine, this is irreversible. It's not as though you take a drug, you can stop it. Once you do this, you can't really go back and put the head back on again. So it is a salvage procedure, it's a last resort. And you're taking away the source of pain. Okay, so if the joint is painful, let's take the joint away, replace it with another joint. Okay, and uh, so there are two different sort of techniques out there right now. I mean, there's a lot of different types, but usually they fall into either cementless versus cemented. So what we talk about cementless or cemented is that whether over here they put any cement or not to put the implant in there. Okay, so um, the old the older technique it all started with cemented. Then after that they went to cementless because using cement can be quite messy in the joints. So to speak but so that is what we call hip replacement also known as total hip replacement and uh, just just to throw a perspective of things it this is usually last for the like uh, for the uh, last for the pet's lifetime you know in humans when we do it they expect to last for between sort of 10 to 12 years then you may have to replace it again okay but for obvious reasons for dogs and cats they don't live as long as us so usually it's a one-off thing so it's not as though you're going to replace it again okay and just for interest, you know, usually, usually, depending on who is doing it, you can range anything between four and a half to five and a half thousand. Who thinks this is very expensive? Excellent. Okay. So, just to give you an idea, human hip replacement is 15K NHS. We don't know that. Okay. And arguably, just because I like to be controversial, if you think about it, a dog's hip replacement, we charge a third of it. Similar technique arguably even more, even harder, bones are smaller, more fragile when you're trying to put the implant in there. And just to let you know what I mean by that, it's like this, so this little bit over here, okay, what happens is that, if you just imagine, so they've cut the bone off, okay, they got to drill a hole inside there, they got to put the implant in there, and they got to hammer it in slowly to make it fit in place. Too hard, bone splits, and I'm sorry. So we're talking about very, very fragile stuff over here. So it's technically not easy. And even harder because the bone is smaller compared to a human with a big femur, you know, big strong bones. Like you off, knocking it. So maybe it's me being a vet, but you know, at a third of what they charge in humans, 15K, the reason why we think it's expensive, and I totally agree, 5K is 5K, come on. <laughs> but the reality is we have no idea. We really have no idea what is medical value <laughs> because of NHS. So in humans, I'm sure you, you either have done it yourself or your friends, your relatives have got hip replacement, it's 15K. Nobody ever gets a bill, so to speak. That's something we go for animals. It's four and a half to five K because we want to do it at a discount. <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's so expensive. Just to throw it out there, just to throw it out there. Uh, but yeah, so that is, um, that is what hip replacement is. Yeah. Um, what about, what other options have you got? Okay, so we've got what we call a femoral head neck excision, okay, of or FHNE for short. So if you take a look over here, this is your femoral bone, this is your head, there's a neck, okay? So femoral head neck excision, as the name suggests, is excising it from here to here, okay? So why do we do that? This is a painful bit that keeps rubbing onto the bone, okay? Once you take the source of pain away, it looks something like this. Okay, do not forget that um, the joint of the hip, it's not just a bone. Plenty of muscles around it. The bone just forms an infra infrastructure. It's almost like talking about a building that is steel reinforced cemented. Taking the steel away, the cement is still there. So that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so if the bone, the joint is causing pain, you can take the source of pain away so that a false joint will form over time and now there's no more pain because there's no more bone grinding bone it's not as painful okay also known as a femoral head neck uh, ostectomy 
Same again. You can't reverse this. It's a one-off thing. You can't put the hip, you can't put the bone back again. So it's a last resort. Uh, removing the source of pain again. And uh, it's quite a fast recovery after a false joint is formed. As you can imagine, there's no more bone rubbing bone. You literally take the source of pain away and you actually just crack on with that really. So what, when is this sort of uh, suitable, so to speak? So as you can imagine, so people may ask, why don't we just do this instead rather than hip replacement? Um, and the reality of it, without the bone, as you can imagine, it can't hold as much weight. So this is quite suitable for cats, or quite suitable for smaller dogs that do not need as much infrastructure to hold the body in place. Okay, and it's been argued uh, both sides again okay, uh, that it can go up to dogs up to 25 kilos. So personally, I've seen a 19 kilo dog having this procedure done and after that running around like Larry, like, you know, happy like Larry, no more problems. And it's like, how do you run like this? You have no joint. <laughs> but um, that is the reality of things. So I've seen as high as that and certainly cats that do very, very well with that. Um, I've seen cats with, you know, uh, very arthritic hips or even, God forbid, road traffic accident, a fractured hip. Then you take that little bit away, then they just heal quite fast. So, um, orthopods, orthopedic surgeons, okay, there have got various papers out there to say that comparison, hip replacement, still do better than femoral hip excision, okay, um, even for very small animals. So there will still be orthopods outside there who say that even for a cat, hip replacement papers have shown that the results are better than uh, femoral hip excision. So, for obvious reasons, a hip replacement in terms of cost is much higher than femoral hip excision. Although I must say it's not very expensive at all, <laughs> but it's still more expensive. So, compared, if the animal is, uh, if the owner is going, look, I can't afford that. What else? Apart from putting to sleep, then for obvious reasons, this would be a quite a viable way to go forward, so to speak, depending on the animal. And we always tell the owners, it's not as good as hip replacement, but it's better than euthanasia <laughs> for obvious reasons. So, uh, and smaller animals tend to cope better than big animals. So like I said, on paper, they say up to 25 kilos. I personally have said 19 kilo. Um, anything more than that, we tend to go hip replacement because as you can imagine, no joint over there, you know, 30, 35 kilo, 40 kilo dog running on that is not going to go very far, so to speak. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I, I can uh, certain, certainly uh, 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 sort of uh, relate to that because that's what I've seen as well. So, um, so certainly that is a viable option. Uh, long term wise, is really uh, tricky to say what happens long term. And uh, for that, I knew that dog did well for the next six, seven years. Then after that, I just lost contact with the dog. So it's hard to say long term well, wise. Was about 14 in cancer, mm. but he had, um, he had quite extensive anal gland surgery. Mm. And the result of the nerves being cut a second time. Mm you could see the wastage and weakness. Mm. But I mean, we were given mm. six, 12 months after the surgery, and we knew it wasn't, it was only gonna be palatable. Yeah. But it, it took that, and he still was going for a walk and still doing it, but when yeah. he stood, you could then see. The difference. Up until then, yeah. we used to take to the vets, and if they had students in, they'd be feeling, trying, because you couldn't feel mm. that it wasn't there. Yeah, no, oh yeah, definitely can't. The, because there's so much muscle on the side. It's, it's, it's just a clear reminder, the hip is not just a bone. A lot of muscles on the side. I've yeah. known a dog that literally had no hip joint, literally. No, mm. he was born with no hip joints. Yeah. But because it was kept so fit, yeah. again, it was an agility dog. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just had muscle keeping its, yeah. its hips in yeah. place. And that thing took a long way. Mm. What's the moral story? Hips, overrated? Yeah. Anybody agree? <laughs> 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 Let's take them out. I think, I think it's the importance of the muscle, I think, is the... Exactly. And the rehab afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You get a weak leg. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and don't forget a lot of reason why we do all this sort of surgery is not to get a perfect hip or whatever. It's to, uh, it's to get the animal back to what it was doing before. So you're going to get the leg moving again. If the leg is moving, relatively pain-free, do we really care what has been done inside there? You're always treating the animal, not the condition. Yeah. So what about arthrodesis? You may have heard of that before. So, so far we have talked about hip replacements and things like that. Um, arthrodesis is fixing the joint. Okay, remember when we said that when an arth arthritic joint is painful when you move it. Yeah? If you don't move it, it's not painful. 
So if you have joints that is almost impossible to replace, like your carpus, okay, your wrist, okay, or your hock, your heel equivalent in dogs, what they do is they fix it so it doesn't move. Okay, so when they fix it, the dog will walk with a limp. It's almost like wearing a metal shoe that you can't flex your knee, uh, your, 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 your sore ankles at all, but your ankle doesn't move, so it's not painful. Does that make sense? So literally, they fix the painful joint, so your painful joint is no longer flexing around. And hence, you can still walk around with a hop, with a limp and things like that, but it is not painful. Yep, so that's why I call arthrodesis. As you can see, it's a fairly extensive surgery. We're talking about plating and immobilizing the joint, okay? Uh, and you're put, talking about putting a lot of screws on top and below, as you can see from all the different plates over here. So uh, you can see over here, this is a shoulder joint because I don't think we have really done shoulder replacement yet. So if there's a very, very bad arthritis there over there, say, okay, let's not move your shoulder joint anymore. So you're gonna walk with a limp, but at least it's no longer moving around. It's no longer painful. So there's a shoulder joint. This is your hock joint, okay? And this is our sort of a wrist equivalent passes. Yeah? Um, what if a dog that's not got this juice trauma, and then you have got an arthritic joint, they don't like to have one arthritic joint. You then fuse that joint, the worst one, isn't there a very high chance that you're then going to end up with problems in their back, the other shoulder, the joints below, the joints above, you know? You're Absolutely. You're going to end up with a dog that's actually, you, you, that bit of pain, which mm. broken the rest of the mm. dog. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. Okay, how we treat one thing can affect everything, the ripple effect. Okay, which is why, number one, same again, last resort. This is not done for fun. So if it's between that and the dog that is hopping lame, so what do we do first? Do we say that I will not do this because I don't want to affect the rest of the body, but you can see the immediate pain over there? Or do we treat that? So everything is case to case basis. Look at the age of the dog. If it is a very young dog, arguably, you don't want to be hopping for the rest of his life. On the same argument, if you do this in a young dog for the rest of his life, we have to prepare for what impact it is to other joints. So because we are talking. There is a likelihood, certainly mm. with arthritis, that it, it can, they can get it early following trauma. So if they've broken a bone mm. young, mm -mm -mm -mm. Then, yeah. then it's yeah. likely. More movement and things like that. Then, yeah. then it's likely this is. You know, they're going to have the arthritis in that joint certainly earlier mm. or more mm. than they would mm. the opposite joint. Mm. Emphasis. Okay, we are on surgical treatment right now, yeah. but this is really, really last resort. So, all the sort of cases usually managed with rest, you know, all your physiotherapy, hydrotherapy, medication, just to get the motion back again. And we know that joint is probably more prone to arthritis, but this is really, really last resort. It's talking about despite all everything that we've done you cannot manage that joint that is very, very painful. Then you fuse it, and yes, the implication of this to all the other joints does happen. Does it make sense? So no, this is not something that we do very, very often at all. In fact, the most common ones are your hip replacement, your sort of, uh, 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 now they even have sort of knee replacement and things like that, or femoral and excision and things like that. Those are more common ones because that's actually, uh, it's more of treating it. This is very rare. I mean, when I say very rare personally, I've seen, I've been working for about 15 years now, I've seen three cases. That is a sort of thing compared to the hip replacement that you do regularly, or the, uh, or, or the, femoral, hip, the femoral hip excision, which I do regularly as well, in general. In, in practice, so to speak. So, very, very rare. I just want to highlight that it is there. Yeah, I so. I was offered a shoulder fixation for a five month puppy and I decided against it. Uh, no, uh, yeah. no socket. Okay. Or without one, apparently. Mm. Quite rare, but it's mm. kind of been birth trauma or something. Sure. Um, but I opted not to do it. And how's that little puppy doing? She's okay. She's mm. four now. Mm. She has a slight, if you look at her gait, it's mm. what you're looking for, you can see it. Yeah. So you you can't win. <laughs> so yeah. So all I'm saying is this is available out there. I'm not saying that we do it often at all. And this is one of the more rarer surgery that that, that is done. It's really. I mean, the orthoport, the orthopedic surgeon would really be going through a lot of things. That like, do you really really want me to do this? Rather than oh yeah, let's go for this. <laughs> So that is, you know, most orthopedic surgeons, they even go, 
okay, I'll do this. This is you must understand this is the last resort. If you are going for this, it means that you have tried this, 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 and this, and this, and this before we even go this. Does it make sense? So this is not a common thing that we do, unlike a hip replacement or a, a femoral head, head neck station. Yeah. Like I said, may continue to limp, but because you're no longer moving that joint, it's pain-free.